God. If you can stand, stand and think we're having a wonderful day. Praise the Lord. I think God is blessed in this church. Praise the Lord Jesus. I could just want to sing one song and if you could join me in it. He never fails me yet. He never fails me yet. Jesus Christ never fails me yet. In this warm atmosphere, I'd like to call you the podium, Minister Matos and the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the Lord again. Hallelujah. God bless you. If you will go ahead and get your Bibles and get to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19, and Jeremiah chapter 18. And while you are getting that, my niece is in the house, and so on her behalf, little Julia, this is your first message, or maybe second or third, but it's for you. I love you very much, and I hope you grow in the Lord. Amen? Amen. To all the extended families, outlaws, in-laws, it's so good to have you. To my pastor's family, it's good to be in service with you, and to all the saints of the Most High. How good to see all your smiling faces again. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for what you have done. Thank you for celebrating with us yesterday, Desmond's birthday party. You guys are wonderful people, and I love you all very much. Now we all know I've said this before. I don't like to preach without the Holy Ghost. I don't want to preach by myself, and I don't want to preach without the anointing. Amen. So everything in this service now comes to this most important part. And I need all of your help. Thank you. God bless you. 2 Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. And it says, Nevertheless, the foundations of God standeth sure. Having this sealed, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse number 4. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hands of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make. And with the Lord's help and the anointing of God, I hope once again to unburden my heart, simply preach broken vessels. Broken vessels vessels. I am burdened even though I am smiling. There is a burden in my heart. Sometimes preachers preach from a revelation. Other times they preach from an experience. And sometimes we preach right where we're at in our very frail humanity. And so once again I find myself on another Sunday morning going to try to compose my emotions to give to you all what God has given to me. So I am a reflection of this message this morning. Broken vessels. Pastor, will you please pray? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, the servant stands behind the sacred desk to minister words of eternal life. We pray you use her, Lord. Unctionize her. Give her clarity of speech and of mind. And we pray you give us receptive hearts and ears. Lord God, we pray that this atmosphere will be conducive to the preaching and the reception of your words. Clear everything that is not of you, Lord. We put down every stronghold right now. We take authority, Lord God. Have your own way. Save somebody through the preaching of your words. Deliver somebody through the preaching of your words. Heal somebody through the preaching of your words. We look to you right now. We leave everything in Jesus' name. Let the church say amen. You may be seated. Amen. Hallelujah. We read in the 
second letter from the Apostle Paul to his son Timothy in the Gospel about things that were happening and things that were about to happen in the church. He told them that in the verse above, chapter verse number 19, that there were people, uh, excuse me, that to study the word and to put away in vain talk and to be mindful of people that were saying the coming of our Lord had already come and throwing the faith of many. In other words, be careful who you fellowship and be careful where you go and be careful who you believe yourself to be aligned with. Don't just take any church as your home church or any doctrine as the doctrine. And don't always believe what somebody tells you. It might be a lie sent from somewhere else. And in this process, people sometimes lie is simply something that has a little bit of truth in it. And it was just enough truth to what they were saying to overthrow the faith of many. It was just enough truth to what they heard that they got a little bit discouraged in their spirit and believed that God was no longer working in their lives. And you know, we look at that and we say, well, that was for that time. But you know what? People don't change. I don't care if it's a hundred, a thousand, a million years in history. People do stay the same. We do tend to hear a word and we come to the conclusion that it must be believable and it must be for me. And we tend to believe negativity more than we believe positivity. We tend to see the bad before we see the good. We tend to believe some bad report before we think of the good of God and the land of the living. But he told Timothy don't be discouraged by what you hear because it's not what you hear all the time. It's what you know. And then he went on to say nevertheless the foundations of God stand if sure. The word nevertheless means notwithstanding. However in spite of regardless of circumstances no matter what I know the foundation I am standing on. So chapter 118 says in verse 22, the stone that the builder rejected has been made the chief cornerstone. Right. Upon this rock will I build my church, yeah. and the gates of hell shall not prevail. In Matthew 16 and 18. So if you know that your foundation is based on the one God and Jesus is his name, there ought to be a steadfastness and unmovableness, and you always ought to be abounding in the word the Lord. See, when you're easily moved, you're easily swayed, but it depends on the foundation that you are. You may bend, but you won't break. You may fall, but you won't stay down. You may slip, but you'll catch yourself. Because my foundation is solid as a rock. I'm not concerned about what people say so much. I'm standing on a foundation. I'm not so concerned about what people think. I'm standing on a foundation. I'm not so concerned about what's coming my way because I'm standing on a foundation. Amen. Hallelujah. And when you have a foundation, you may cry and you may moan and you may groan, but there's something about it. Even though I'm crying on the outside, I'm standing on the inside because I have a confidence in who I have believed. You don't see the wind but you know it's blowing. I may not see God, but who's this living on the inside of me? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the reason is, Paul went on to write, God knoweth them that are his. The reason why my foot is so sure, the reason why I walk with steady steps, the reason why I keep persevering is because God knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, I shall come forth. In other words, he that keepeth the majesty and his eye is on the sparrow, you know his name or your name is carved in his hand. And if you live for God, you must first understand you don't live by your feeling, you live by your faith. In other words, you live by what you know. I may not righteous man, I may not feel like having 
confidence in God that says as long as I'm waiting, I know he's going to answer. My faith in God is not superficial. It's not shallow. It's not easily swayed. I haven't come this far to turn back now. God ain't been this good to me. Everybody don't walk in favor. It rains on 
the just and the unjust, but favor don't rest on everybody. So if the favor is resting on you, you better be thankful that it's resting on you. If God knows your name, your address, your telephone number, you better be glad he knows exactly where you're at. Because everybody don't have the luxury of God knowing who they are. Stay with me. We're getting somewhere. Rich. Hallelujah. And Paul wrote, not only is it important for you to know that God knows you, you must also do something in this process. He wrote on to say, let everyone that nameth the Lord depart from iniquity. Just to bring it down to our everyday language, what that really means is leave your sin outside the door and get in the church. Just don't get in the church, let the church get in you. You just can't come here and take up a seat. You gotta let God come on the inside of you. It's not good enough to have the Holy Ghost all around you, but don't got no Holy Ghost in you. It ain't good enough for a preacher to get up here and preach. If ain't no Holy Ghost coming out of the vessel, God is trying to use. Ain't no point if you come in a church sitting there looking real nice if the Holy Ghost all around you, but ain't nothing coming out of your spirit. Leave your drunk out the door and get in the church. Leave your adultery out the door and get in the church. Leave your fornication out the door and get in the church. Leave your hypocritical, bad mouth spirit out the door and get in the church. I make the comment many times. I never want to preach without the Holy Ghost. I never want to feel coming up here without the Holy Ghost. I never want to walk up here with just a bunch of notes and just think I'm going to say something without divine appointment and without divine option. And you all shouldn't come here not wanting something in your spirit that reaches up and says, God, give me something. God, fill me up. God, speak to me. Change my life. Change my point of view. Change who I am. But I'm trying to be more like you.
because that's my thought. Yeah. And I'm always consciously wondering if my boy is going to be okay. Make sure my affairs are in order. Because I've got somewhere to go. And I have something to do. Yeah. Am I longing for death? No. But I'm just trying to give you an illustration. There's nothing here that I want. And there's nothing here that's keeping me. There's nothing here desiring me to stay behind. It. But I have something I'm going for. I have a God who's yeah. calling me by name. Face the but face. Paul went on to write, but in a great house, there are many vessels. And you know, pastor, people think a great house is the building that you're in. They think it's the property that you're residing in. They think it's the production you have that don't make a house. They think it's the big crowd of numbers. They think it's the big choir and the big band. And the big program, and I'm not against all of those things. But that's not what makes a great house. What makes a great house is a great God. I've said what makes a great house is a great God. And I just have a question for you. If God was to walk in right now, in physical form, I wonder what all of you would be doing. Think about it. It look real nice. But I don't know about you. I'd drop this mic and I'd be the first one back there. If I had to step on you, push you down, run you down, kick you, bite you, punch you, tell you off, I'd be the first one to greet her. Because my God is so great. And just to behold his beauty. And just to finally say, God, about time you got here. I've been waiting 33 years to meet you. How great is our God? How big do you see your God? You see, this house ain't nothing special about it. The people are real nice, trust me. The people are real special, but really ain't nothing special in this house. You sing real beautiful, but ain't nothing special about your singing. You play real nice, but there ain't nothing special about your playing. We preach our best, but our preaching ain't half of anything. Ain't nothing around this house good, but God is good. It's not because I'm good, he's good. It's not because we're great, he's great. It's not because we're wonderful, he's wonderful. It's not because we're mighty, we, he is mighty. But you see, you have to know who your God is. And I have read this before. As a matter of fact, it's written in a whole different color. But I just had to say it one more time. Because I want heaven to hear me declare how great is my God. My God is almighty. My God is all wise. My God is ever present. He's eternal. He's the Father. He's the Spirit. He's the Sustainer. He's the Father of all. He's the Holy One. He's the Judge. He's holy. He's the peace. He's the grace. He's the all in all. He's strong. He's a rock. He's patient. He's caring. He's a Redeemer. He's grand. He's regal. He's splendor. He's true. He's the One. He's the Creator. He's good. He's the Redeemer. He's the Word. He's powerful. He's great. He's excellent. He's the Messiah, and I could just do one column, but that doesn't even get to starting about who my God is. You see, He's excellent, He's powerful, He's a protector, He's a friend, He's a mentor, He's a master, He's a king, He's the Lord, He's the life, He's faithful. And if I stop right there, I still wouldn't be talking about my God because He's amazing, He's gracious, He's radiant. He's just, he's all but good. 